See what happens to your mind when there are no questions. Where does it go? Be aware of the mind's expectation to hear some marvelous non-dual teaching that is finally going to make everything okay. But then, when there is no non-dual teaching, when there are no questions and no answers, what does the mind do with this residual expectation? Does it just go towards another object, another fantasy? Where does it go? Does boredom begin to set in after a few minutes? Boredom is just the other side of expectation. I need an object to make me happy. I need some marvelous non-dual words to finally make everything okay. But when they don't come, where does the mind go for relief from its boredom? Does it just go towards the next daydream, the next fantasy? It's been going there for years. It doesn't work. If objective experience was able to produce happiness, surely we would have found the ultimate objective experience by now. Has this, uh, what we were uh, talking about, has it brought you peace and happiness? Uh, are you asking me? Yes. The answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> and uh, one more question. Um, in my life, when I go through a difficult moment, it's uh, really difficult for me to start asking these kind of questions. Uh, for me, what has worked in the last few months. Why is it difficult for you to ask these questions when life gets difficult? My first teacher Shantananda Saraswati used to tell the story of a woman called Kunti who prayed for adversity. She prayed to God for adversity and said to him, the reason I pray for adversity is that it is only in adversity that I remember you. Why do difficulties in your life make it impossible for you to ask these questions. Turn it around. Use the difficulties in your life to bring these fo questions into focus. The reason there are difficulties in your life is because you have ignored the experience of being aware. Use your suffering to encourage you to deeply investigate where happiness lies. Be thankful for the suffering because it intensifies your investigation. Mm. 
when you say, I am suffering, instead of trying to relieve that suffering through the acquisition of objects, substances, activities, states of mind and relationships, investigate this self, the I that is suffering. What is it in my experience that is truly worthy of the name I? What has remained with me throughout all circumstances, in all situations, at all times? Only that is worthy of the name I. What is that? And is that one suffering? Say that again, the last part. The last four words, I didn't get them. What did I say? <laughs> Is, okay. is, is that one suffering? Mm. Very hard d for me. D d does, the, does the screen ever suffer the fate of the characters in the movie? The screen is totally open to everything that takes place in the movie. It doesn't have to defend itself against any experience. Awareness is like the space of this room. It cannot be harmed by experience. At any moment of experience, if you ask yourself, can what I essentially am, or is what I essentially am harmed or hurt, or stained by the current experience? The answer is always no. The current experience flows through you and it leaves you in the same pristine condition. You awareness. See that. See it clearly. Understand it. Feel it. And then you never have to defend yourself. You don't have to lock yourself up into an ivory tower, witnessing presence of consciousness over in the background of experience somewhere. You can go out into experience. You can have a job, you can have a family. You can go anywhere that your character takes you in life because you know that what you essentially are is intimately one with all experience and yet absolutely free of it. You're safe everywhere. Okay, <clears throat> I don't really know how to do that. Um, it seems to be a it, you huge can't, leap. You can't do it. You have to see it clearly or understand it. What does the space of this room have to do in order to make itself uh, unharmable? Does the space continually have to work at protecting itself from everything that takes place? I mean, imagine, for instance, if we were all to stand up now and start dancing or even fighting. What would the space have to do to protect itself? Would it have to practice mantra meditation in order to protect itself from being harmed by all the activity in the room? Or would it just be totally open? to whatever was going on, because of this deep knowledge that it has, I cannot be touched, and yet I touch everything intimately. I cannot be hurt or harmed or stained by what takes place in this room, and therefore I have no need to defend myself against it. I can be totally open to it. It's not something the space does, it is what it is. You, awareness, are already, already totally open to all experience. You don't have to add anything to awareness to make it open and imperturbable. That is its nature. What I mean is that is your nature. Just see that.
And if you can't see that, come back to my meeting tomorrow. <laughs> I will. Thank you. Time for one last question. <laughs>